Thank you, Dr. Anthony, very much for that introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you all for staying to hear about the core issue involving U.S. policy in the Middle East. Um, last year, I mentioned uh, my, one of my favorite works that, um, that helps, to, helps people to understand these uh, happy warriors we see up here on the panel. It's called The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus' great book. And uh, that title has a, a double meaning, the story of Sisyphus and also the misinterpretation of the story, the myth. Um, a quote from it sticks in my mind um, where Camus says, reaching for the heights is enough to lift the heart. We must imagine Sisyphus happy. <laughs> and uh, I think that's true. These uh, people get up every day and uh, push that boulder up the hill. And uh, it is not a depressing task, even though uh, one might think it is. At any rate, um, I believe we have the bios of all the speakers in your book, so I'm not going to read them. But um, we'll um, start the panel with uh, Yusuf Bashir, who um, is the author of The Words of My Father and a former Palestinian uh, diplomatic delegation member to the United Nations, United States, sorry. Um, at any rate, uh, let's start it off and um, please give uh, him your full attention. Thank you, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with you. I thought uh, one of the first things that I wanted to accomplish by being here today was to offer the uh, human touch to the problem uh, in Gaza uh, and leave it to the experts uh, to help me uh, give you the full picture afterwards. I am, my name is Yusuf Khalil Salman Ahmed Mustafa Khalil Salman Bashir. My family is 320 years old from Gaza. My, the, th the name of the town is Devil Balah. I was raised on a large piece of land in the middle of the Strip. My family sold on large quantities of vegetables to Israel, uh, Egypt, and Jordan. My dad, uh, who had also taught English, was always keen on uh, pushing his children to always believe uh, in peace, reconciliation, not only with our neighbors uh, uh, around the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, but with all my fellow human beings. My house was located near an Israeli settlement by the name of Kfar de Rome, one of the very first settlements to be established in the Strip and next to uh, my house. Uh, everything was going quiet, calm. I was 11 when the Second Intifada started. The soldiers started shooting at the house and all the other nearby houses, hoping that the uh, inhabitants of, the, of these houses would leave and abandon their homes. And that happened. Two of our neighbors left. And so shortly after, the bulldozers came to demolish the houses. And that was another reason for my father that we were not going to abandon our home because becoming a refugee was not an option. I was 11 years old when the Israelis started shooting at our house and then took over the second floor, third floor of the house. And when they were done, they came downstairs and told my family and my father, from now on, no relatives are allowed into the house and we are going to be upstairs. And from that moment on, from September of 2000, we lived in the living room uh, every single night where the Israeli soldiers used and slept on our beds in the rest of the house. That large house that I took for granted, that beautiful life that I knew, uh, was now uh, destroyed by the soldiers. The frustrating part for me was not the soldiers. Uh, you know, to me, as at uh, 11 years old, that's what soldiers do. The frustrating part was my dad. My dad insisted on teaching me that no matter what you do, no matter what happens, you were born a Palestinian, an Arab, and a Muslim, and that what we do as people here is that we will always give peace and reconciliation another chance despite what they do. They tried to push him out of the house. They demolished his entire fleet of greenhouses. They injured him in the back of his neck in front of the CNN crew, and in 2004, when I turned 15, in front of him, my mother, my grandmother, and three United Nations officers, one of the soldiers who just granted the permission to the visitors to come in, decided for no reason to shoot me in the back. That moment would change my life. It was one sound, just like that, in front of everyone. 
Uh, and after I collapsed, after I thought I was on my way uh, near the end of my life, I opened my eyes in a hospital called Tel Shemir in the middle of Tel Aviv, Israel. To me, as a Palestinian, that was my very first time to see uh, a new face of the Israeli state, the Jewish people, uh, because up until that point, it was only my father who was reminding me of the concept of children of Abraham, who was not the soldiers, who was not the settlers. After spending a year, three months in uh, surgery, uh, an additional year in, in rehab, the Israelis doctors and nurses taught me how to walk again despite leaving the bullet in my back. Uh, and that is what uh, changed, uh, put me on the path, a spiritual path, and brought me closer to my identity as a Palestinian, as a Muslim, as an Arab, and brought me closer to my father. Unfortunately, when I left the hospital with my newly found vision, the soldiers were still there. And despite everything that uh, my father continued to promote and advocate uh, for them, uh, uh, they still continued their way of harassing, hoping that he would give up the house and, and leave uh, sooner rather than later. But that was not, never going to happen. In 2005, and after long five years, the Israeli state decided to unilaterally withdraw from the Strip. And when 500 soldiers or more, the base was uh, now being demolished, when the last group of soldiers left the house, my dad ran upstairs for the very first time in five years and told me and the rest of the family that I, I told you I was going to get the house back. And today, the house, me and my brothers and sisters, we own that house, we, I can still, I lived in the US for 13 years, but I can still point to that house and say, I'm from Gaza, and I'm a Palestinian, and I'm proud of that. Now, I'm one of the very lucky ones. My family had the resources to send me abroad to study. My brothers went to Germany, my sisters went to Germany, and I came here. But many of my fellow Palestinians, especially today, over the last 10 years, residing in Gaza, do not have that option. And we have to ensure that on an individual basis, case by case, because of the unemployment, the uh, political unrest, many young people in Gaza are denied the opportunities that I was given. And I hope that in the future, in the very, very near future, all of us here in this room try to uh, do something about that. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Campbell. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me and um, providing me with the opportunity to talk a little bit um, about UNRWA. The, the main question that I wanted to sort of discuss today is, and it's very interesting in light of the comments that General Petraeus was just making, but the question really is, why did the United States walk away from its most successful human development project in the Middle East? And what's at stake? I would argue that um, one of the most successful human development projects in the United States, certainly something that historically the US not only helped to found and create, but politically and financially supported for 70 years, is the agency uh, that I represent, the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees, or otherwise known as UNRWA. Probably many of you know this, but just in brief, um, it's the agency that was established in 1949 in the wake of the refugee crisis following the Arab-Israeli war. It was stood up as a temporary agency to provide relief and services to those who had fled. We operate in Gaza, the West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. The idea was that the UN um, and US leadership would quickly find a resolution to the conflict, and then, of course, UNRWA would dissolve because Palestinians um, and their needs, their health care and their uh, education needs would obviously be taken care of uh, by a state, which is what uh, should be the case. 70 years later, um, UNRWA is still in existence for the obvious reason that there has been no political solution to the Arab-Israeli war. What is UNRWA? UNRWA is education, it's health care, and it's food assistance. Those are the fundamental things that we do. But it's very important to understand the scale and scope of our work. 
We run over 700 schools. We educate more than 535,000 girls and boys. To give you a sense of the scale of that work, if you brought UNRWA to the United States, it would probably be about the third largest school system um, after Los Angeles and New York, okay? Secondly, I mentioned healthcare. We have a network of over 140 primary healthcare clinics in the five areas that I mentioned, providing essential services like vaccination, um, prenatal care for mothers, um, and medicine, et cetera, um, which are not available to most Palestinians um, otherwise. And then this third component, Humanitarian assistance. Certainly, we're not, sadly, alone in the Middle East in providing humanitarian assistance. But in a place like Gaza, we are basically alone. Um, of the 2 million inhabitants um, residing there, UNRWA provides food assistance uh, for now more than half of the total population. So clearly um, an essential life-saving uh, intervention. So what's at stake and why did the Americans uh, walk away from this? I think there's probably no other example in the globe, I'm happy to be challenged on this, of a people achieving such a high level of human development absent a state. It's actually a remarkable achievement over 70 years, these institutions that have been built up. And I think, again, as, as the general rightly noted in the, in the previous panel, these are not things that you turn on and off, where one day you say we're building a school system, and the next year you say we're no longer investing in that school system. These are things that evolve, um, in fact, now over several generations to achieve a certain level of efficiency, excellency, um, et cetera. So what's at stake is obvious, right? When the U.S. decided last year, um, uh, without warning and somewhat uh, and in a very unexpected way to stop funding the agency, it had been providing about 30% of our total funding, um, it had been our largest donor for over 70 years, and obviously a huge um, political supporter of, of the enterprise. Um, it was obviously very shocking. We were successful in closing that financial gap, um, basically through generous donations, from the European Union, its various member states, um, but also some of the Gulf countries who, who stepped up and provided much needed funding. It remains to be seen if we will be as successful this year. Um, we still need roughly $100 million to close the gap, uh, to pay our teachers to keep the schools open, to pay our doctors and nurses to keep the healthcare um, system running. So what's at stake is obviously the future um, of these children and whether or not they will have an education system. Um, obviously the health and well-being of those who benefit from our food assistance and our health care assistance. So at the human level, it's, it's somewhat obvious. You know, if these institutions were to dissolve or to otherwise um, be destroyed, it's obvious uh, at the human level. But I would also argue that this is not something that should be seen in isolation. Again, I think the general said it quite well. You know, whether it's the US or any other type of military, a security footprint is one thing, but to maintain security, it requires an educated and a healthy population. And that's what UNRWA has been doing um, for Palestine refugees now uh, for 70 years. You pull the plug on that, it's, it's unclear what the implications would be, but there is no doubt in my mind you would have very significant and consequential uh, security implications across the region if suddenly you find half a million kids without access to education and absolutely no alternative, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the reasons the, the, there is one reason why the U.S. walked away from this development project, which I think for anyone who's worked across this region, but in general knows how difficult it is to establish highly de effective humanitarian and development programming. And that reason is political. That's it. It's for a political reason, completely unrelated to Palestine refugees and co themselves and completely unrelated to, to UNRWA. It was largely in response to its decision to move its embassy to Jerusalem, um, which faced uh, sharp criticism in the form of two votes in the Security Council and then in the General Assembly in late 2018. And for that, and for the role that the Palestinian Authority played in strongly opposing the US decision, um, the United States cut UNRWA's funding. Um, and it's very clear that, it, that from, as from a policy perspective, it's, it's not likely uh, to, to be turned back on. So 
maybe what I can just sort of say very quickly and then happy to, to answer um, questions. Um, a few things have emerged that are clear. The international consensus on support for UNRWA remains as strong as ever. Um, uh, just as recent as um, last month, in fact, um, on the margins of the UN General Assembly in New York, where ministers gathered, um, one country after the other um, reaffirmed its very strong financial and political support for the agency, underlining that it is essential um, until there is a just and lasting uh, solution in the Middle East. Uh, that's, that's the first point. And the second point, though, that I would emphasize is that despite that robust uh, support, there is no doubt that our institutions have been uh, significantly weakened uh, without U.S. engagement, both politically and financially, um, and that we remain um, under threat. And the possibility that UNRWA would have to consider closing down some of its, its schools or its food assistance in Gaza um, remains quite real. Um, and not something that should be seen uh, or not, you know, sort of underestimated or overlooked. So in addition to this financial situation that we continue to grapple with, um, uh, we are also facing real operational realities on the ground. Um, it is now formal uh, policy of the government of Israel to remove our services and work from East Jerusalem. Um, and we continue to, to face those challenges that come from operating in places that the government now says it'll eventually absorb into its own, um, into its own system. The third piece that we also continue to grapple with that, again, um, is, is certainly weakening our institution is sort of these broader politics, or what I like to refer to as urban myths that are constantly launched at the agency. Um, and the favorite one that's sort of repeated all of the time to try to discredit the work we do is that we are an agency that serves uh, fake refugees. Um, the argument is that descendants of Palestinian refugees are not in fact refugees and therefore should not be afforded any form of international protection and assistance and therefore UNRWA is unnecessary. Now, it's, it's a ridiculous argument, it's a false argument, but it's certainly uh, growing in strength um, across um, parliaments and uh, government stakeholders uh, around the world, which obviously negatively impacts our ability to effectively uh, fundraise. So in conclusion, what can be done? What's, what's the way forward? The most obvious way forward is that the United States needs to restore uh, it's funding until there is a viable alternative. And here I just want to pause and, and say one thing, that given recent developments in the U.S. Congress, UNRWA is in fact the only entity that the U.S. government at this time can fund that would benefit Palestinians. Every other option currently has been closed off by various um, uh, U.S. laws, whether it's through the Taylor Force Act or through something called the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act. Those laws now make it impossible, even if there was a new policy or a different policy coming from the U.S. administration, for the U.S. government to provide uh, foreign assistance to Palestinians. So currently, under U.S. law, UNRWA is the only entity that is not adversely restricted um, by law to which the U.S. can provide funding. So it's something to really consider and remember um, uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have two more speakers. Who would like to go next? Sean? <laughs> This is related somewhat to the work of UNRWA. That's why maybe this is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Shukran Mabruk. Uh, congratulations, uh, National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations and Dr. Anthony. Uh, thank you for having this panel. Thank you, all of you, for, for being here. And um, congrats to the Council for the continued focus on building better relations through education and exchange, and particularly with a focus on youth. You're right, Dr. Anthony, that um, not many Americans uh, graduate or have a full uh, four years in undergraduate or graduate work in the Middle East. I, I believe, I hope, that there is increasing interest from Americans, at least in doing a study abroad. My daughter just got back from a semester at, at AUB in, in Beirut, and uh, she called me this afternoon and asked where I was. I said, I'm at this conference, and um, she said, send me the link, and I sent her the link, and she wrote back immediately and said, the author of Words of My Father is at the conference. 
So I've read your book, uh, Yusuf. It's a wonderful story of, of, of resilience, of resistance, of hope, of spirit, of, uh, of generosity. Um, thank you. Uh, she's reading it now. The Future Prospects for Palestinians is the title of this panel, and many say the prospects are bleak. And when I think about the politics and the, the lack of effective leadership on the Palestinian question on peace, uh, it's very depressing. Uh, the US naming uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, the move of the embassy to Jerusalem, the Israeli elections, where neither of the major figures and parties are talking about the Palestinian issue, occupation, peace, um, there's very little difference between them. Um, and there's no peace plan or real process. U.S. government funding, um, as Elizabeth just said, has cut all assistance to Palestinian aid. And it's to UNRWA, but it's also bilateral aid. And it's also, people forget, it's aid for Palestinian programs outside of, of the Palestinian territories, for UNRWA, but also for other UN agencies. Uh, Anira, I'm the head of American Near East Refugee Aid, still gets some funding from UNHCR and UNICEF for Palestinian work, but it sort of comes under the umbrella of the Syrian response work. Um, and the Gulf has followed the U.S. lead. Uh, we thought originally it was just sort of, well, if the U.S. isn't doing it, we don't necessarily need to do it either. But we understand from leaders in the region that uh, President Trump and, and Kushner have actually asked the leaders to not fund Palestinians all under the hope that this will bring Palestinians to the negotiating table. Uh, for ANIRA, we had a $100 million cooperative agreement with the US Agency for International Development to build Palestinian community infrastructure. And we were about $72 million into the funding there. So it's $28 million worth of programming funding that we could have uh, done that's lost. We lost 2 thirds of our Palestinian staff from 75 down to 25. We've hired a couple back um, recently. Our largest office is in Gaza, so you're not alone in Gaza. Um, and our second largest office is in East Jerusalem, and we're still in uh, Ramallah. When the funding was cut, I decided to write a little message to our community and to um, go over to Palestine and record it in, uh, in Palestine. And I stood uh, next to uh, Sincilla, a uh, stone wall uh, terrace in the Olive Grove. And I said that uh, one state, two state, we're just focused on the human state. No politics, no religion, just humanity. And I tell you that because our staff in Palestine, but also in, in Lebanon, they really, they, they're very proud of that. They're very proud that that is the focus. And so I want to take just a few minutes to talk about our focus and the recommendation that if we keep the focus on human development, the prospects for Palestinians, in fact, is not so bleak. Um, we, uh, we do humanitarian aid. We do about one shipment a, a week worth about a million dollars a shipment um, of medical medicines and medical supplies, and it's actually up this year. Um, but our real focus is on, on development, and the development funding was cut, but we're focused on figuring out how we get other funding uh, for that. And we're focused on what are the priorities. And so in any development program in any country, and I think a main message I, I have for us is let's treat this like a regular development program. We're working with people who want, uh, who want normal lives with security, with jobs, with their children in good schools. Um, and so what are the sustainable development goals? Which ones of those are relevant for Palestine and Palestinian communities? What are the national development priorities? As we all know, um, it is not a, a, a poor community. Many of the poverty indicators are actually quite good. As you know, literacy is very high, 97% literacy in the West Bank, 98% in Gaza. Um, but what are the gaps and priorities? Well, youth unemployment is a huge one. It's a problem around the world, and it's a problem in the Middle East. But in, uh, in Palestine, it's 40%. Women in the workforce, there's still not enough opportunities um, and structural uh, um, uh, uh, mechanisms for women in the workforce. And uh, it's not education overall. Education is strong. Palestinians tell me education is our religion. Education is our only hope. It's what keeps uh, host us hopeful for the future. But there are gaps. One of them is that there has not been universal uh, early childhood development, kindergarten, preschool. Uh, and also, there is a gap between what students are learning in schools, the, what they're graduating with, and whether that allows them to get a job. So let me focus on those three areas quickly. On early childhood development, we've worked with the Palestinian Authority, with the Education Ministry, 
um, to help them understand the research, which says, and the minister told me this, he said, you know, Sean, for every dollar we invest in early childhood development, society gets seven dollars return on that. So they understand now and have declared kindergarten to be uh, mandatory universally. What does that mean? Well, probably 1,000 to 2,000 kindergartens need to be built. Anira, over the last nine years, has built or rehabilitated 208, so 10 percent of the existing stock, but we need another 1,000 to 1,200 probably. We believe that at the scale we're working, the, 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 the approach, the methodology, it's very sustainable. The, the municipal government or a local landowner gives the land. Once we build the school, the ministry takes it over and, and, uh, and maintains it, puts the teachers in. But we have a national curriculum that we've developed. Dr. Ilham Nasser developed a curriculum which is inclusive, it's uh, ethical, um, it's national. It was agreed between Gaza and, uh, and the West Bank. And we do the teacher training, mentoring, the age-appropriate uh, to, uh, toys, furniture, uh, solar panels, et cetera. So we're building sustainable preschools that are taken over uh, by the ministry. And we're saying, if another 1,200 are needed, let's not do a few. Let's do a few hundred. Can we do another 200? Can we do 300? Can we do 400? On women in the workforce, very quickly, we're working in Gaza on greenhouses. And uh, women are earning three times the national average uh, income by uh, growing 30 tons of, of, uh, of tomatoes in a, in a greenhouse, sorry, three tons, not 30 tons, three tons of tomatoes in the course of a year in their greenhouse and making three times uh, the national income. We're working uh, a program called Women Can where we're saying, uh, we're working with women and asking them what is it that they do? What is it they're good at or they'd like to do? Sewing, uh, uh, catering, animal husbandry, and providing some seed funding to get them uh, up and running and providing some business uh, uh, capacity building as well. Finally, on the, on the skills gap, we're partnering with an organization in Jordan called Reboot Camp, which has had huge success. They've graduated 200 Jordanians and Syrian refugees, and 100% of them have gotten jobs in the tech sector. So this is an education program that uses an immersive boot camp extreme learning with a focus on coding, but we can put any curricula in, but a focus on coding because that's where the jobs are and 100% are getting work. This is a very uh, promising area. As you know, there are about a million people in the three countries Anira works in, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. There are about a million people out of work. It's, it's estimated there'll be a million tech sector jobs in the region in the next five years. So again, we're saying here's an opportunity here, but we don't want to do 100 or 200. Can we do 100,000 of those million? That gets me to the financing, and this is where we're seeing, we're seeing things change overall on development, and I think, again, Palestine doesn't need to be the place that can't access innovation and new ways of doing things. So there's a lot of focus. It's not governments providing funding anymore, and we have to operate as if U.S. funding won't come back. I believe it will, but I think it's prudent for us to act as if it won't, um, and also uh, governments when they are putting money in, they don't want to be the only ones. They recognize we're not the only ones with money and certainly not the only ones with ideas and innovation. It's coming from everywhere. Increasingly, donors want to pay for success. They don't want to just give money for a training and not know what the outcomes are or give money for scholarships and not know whether that scholarship, that education really provided a job. So in Palestine, the World Bank is doing a development impact bond where they will pay for our placement of graduates into jobs, and they won't pay until they've been in the job for six months. So they want 1,500 Palestinians to be put into jobs. Uh, we're saying we can do 100 of those. The very interesting part of this model is we have to guarantee 100, but if we do more than 100, they'll pay us for those as well. So it's almost like a dividend or a profit on, uh, on what we've said we would do. Increasingly, donors at all levels, individuals and governments, are going to want to look at this. Let me talk for just a minute about, uh, further about the funding. Partnerships and leverage is important. We're getting UN funding in Lebanon, but increasingly because they're not getting all of the funding, and it isn't just UNRWA, the cuts for UNRWA have been worse, but UNICEF and UNHCR are only at about 24% of the funding needed in, in, uh, in Lebanon on the Syria crisis, they're asking for cash leverage, 10%, 20%. So if we as an organization, can say to an individual, we can access this million dollar UN project if you or a collection of you can provide the 100,000 or the 200,000 
dollar match. There's enough wealth out there to do this work. General Petraeus mentioned the U.S. is going to be uh, implementing the International Development Finance Corporation. Again, this is looking at donors want to look at investments rather than, than charity and giving money away. That funding isn't all there yet, um, but if it is there, it would, he said twice, it would actually be about three times the uh, average annual USAID budget. Personal wealth, household wealth in the United States is $100 trillion, $100 trillion. 75% of that is liquid. In 2018, U.S. households and businesses, bequests, uh, foundations gave away $428 billion. So about 0.5% uh, of just the household wealth was given away by households and corporations, foundations, et cetera. If you think about zakat and the, um, and the requirement for Muslims to give away 2.5%, of their wealth, that would be 250 trillion, sorry, $2.5 trillion. $2.5 trillion would be given away each year. I'm not even going to talk about Christian tithings, which are 10%. Um, if the same percentage of funding that went overall to uh, charity uh, that went to international affairs, that is of the $428 billion which went to international affairs in 2018, $23 billion went to international affairs, including work like uh, ours, so that's 5%. If that same 5% were applied to the $2.5 trillion, it would be $125 billion. That's uh, six to eight times the USAID budget and uh, two times the International Development Finance Corps um, proposal. Now, to accomplish the SDGs by 2030, there needs to be six or seven trillion dollars of investment. There's about a trillion right now, so we need to multiply that by six or seven. So it's easy to start to see where more of this funding is going to come from. And I don't think it's a shift from the government does nothing and individuals do everything. I think it's a question of partnerships. So let me end with a recommendation, and Dr. Anthony wanted us to make recommendations, and it's a simple one. I, whatever the prospects are for peace, don't stop investing in human development because that's the fastest way to human development, but it's also the way to peace. And I'm, it's, it is, it's difficult and disheartening to work in a moment where there are no prospects and no real leadership on the peace side. And I've worked in international development and uh, democratic development for 30 plus years, and I've never believed that you do one and then the other. You have to work in parallel on both of them. But if one's not uh, moving, you don't stop on the other one because eventually one pulls the other alongside. So I, I ask people, whether you're policymakers, funders, or people who talk with policymakers and funders, take a look at what is having excess, uh, success in building human development and societal development and invest in that. Thank you. It is a privilege to be sharing a panel with all these wonderful people, and I'm glad that I'll be able to address this audience on this critical issue. I would like to start with something that does not sound like conventional wisdom and may sound even unserious at first glance, but which happens to be true anyway, which is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the simplest, least complicated conflict going on in the world right now. But that requires us looking at it from, a very, from very particular lenses. If you look at it from a moral lens, the problem fundamentally is that the Palestinian people are denied the basic right to freedom, and if they were to be granted that freedom, the conflict would be over. If you were to look at it from a legal perspective, international law is incredibly clear about what is unfolding on the ground. The acquisition of territory by force is a violation of international law, and if international law were to be applied strictly on the situation in Israel-Palestine, that conflict would be over pretty quickly as well. Now, where is the complication? The complication comes in when you look at things from a political perspective specifically, because issues of law and morality are relegated to a pretty insignificant level, and what we're looking at is a problem of a balance of power and of political interests. And when you look at it from that particular lens, then you can see how things are complicated, because Israel is pursuing a policy of expansion throughout the Palestinian territories, denial of refugees' rights. These are all policies that are at the legal and moral expense of the Palestinian people, 
but they're policies that Israel can actually pursue because they have the power to pursue it. When you look at it from the US perspective, you have a problem of lack of political will on the United States part, even though the US is interested in resolving the conflict, a lack of political will to apply the necessary pressure to bring an end to that conflict. It is within the United States power. Israel is the single largest recipient of US foreign aid, receiving roughly $4 billion every single year. Um, Israel gets protected at the United Nations by US vetoes, a total of well over 40 vetoes um, since the 1970s, which to put it in perspective is greater than the number of all vetoes cast by all other permanent members of the United Nations Security Council combined on all issues for the same period. Now, there was a debate within the Arab American community, the community that I'm active with, that looks at things from a human rights perspective for the most part. And the debate was US policy for so long has effectively enabled Israeli policies that there was nowhere to go but up. That the prospect of Donald Trump presidency administra and administration could not possibly make things worse because how much worse could it, could it get? The United States effectively provided a carte blanche for Israel to behave however it wanted. That perspective proved to be obviously false now looking back at it because a figurative carte blanche for Israel to behave as it wants is not as bad as a literal carte blanche for Israel to behave however it wants. And lack of adequate American objection to Israeli policies is not as bad as enthusiastic American participation in Israel's war on the Palestinians, which is effectively what we're experiencing right now under the Trump administration. Just to list a few things that were mentioned, some of them were mentioned earlier. Elizabeth mentioned the cutting of all USA to UNRWA. Um, Sean mentioned quite a few other things. I'll just go through a quick list. Recognizing Israel's acquisition of territory by force as legitimate in a violation of international law. We saw that with the Syrian Golan Heights, turning international law upside down and saying that Israeli occupation is legitimate. That is effectively what the Trump administration's policy is, and it is a significant break with the US policy throughout different administrations. Recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and neglecting any Palestinian rights to the city. Shutting down the Palestinian diplomatic mission in Washington, D.C. Shutting down the American consulate in East Jerusalem that serves Palestinians there. Removing all references to the occupation from official State Department documents and removing the Palestinian territories from the State Department website entirely. In addition to those eight cuts. And in the case of a couple of visits from American Congress members to the Palestinian territories recently, the effort by Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib to visit the Palestinian territories, you had an unprecedented situation where the American administration was calling on an ally to deny the entry of American members of Congress into the Palestinian territories. It is difficult to find words to describe this policy apart from American participation in Israel's perpetuation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a bit incoherent when you consider the fact that the occupation does not serve American interests. We have an interest in regional stability. Um, when you look at opinion polls throughout the Arab world, one of the biggest reasons for lack of American political popularity in the region has to do with America's enablement of Israeli policies towards the Palestinians. And there is a common sense thing, which is to say that if Israeli policies are preventing the conflict from being resolved, the, perpetu the perpetuation of the conflict is by definition a component of instability that makes things uncertain moving forward. And even though these are not things that serve American interests, the Trump administration looks at things almost exclusively through a domestic policy lens, and they carry out policy based on what is popular with the base and not necessarily what is in America's long-term interests in the region. In addition to the significant shift in American policy, there is also a significant shift in Israeli policy. I wouldn't call it significant, perhaps it became more explicit, because for anybody who was observing Israel's expansion of settlements throughout the Palestinian territories, it was pretty clear that Israel was not really interested in a two-state solution. It just does not go along with Israel's continued expansion of settlements throughout the Palestinian territories. But what we have today is that this coy and implicit policy has become more explicit, where the Benjamin Netanyahu administration is very open about the fact that they oppose Palestinian independence or self-determination. They effectively, openly at this point, support of a policy of apartheid where Palestinians are perpetually living under Israeli control without a say into their own future. You have 
Also, for people who are familiar with the situation within Israel itself, not the occupied Palestinian territories, where Palestinians are effectively treated as second-class citizens, where there is a wide range of discriminatory policies that, that they face. And what we have now is also that status becoming more explicit with the passage of the nation state law in Israel, which declares that the right to self-determination is unique to the Jewish people, meaning that Palestinian citizens of Israel are not equal citizens of the state. And you have an escalation in the sort of slow motion ethnic cleansing campaign that is unfolding in East Jerusalem, where now the efforts to demolish homes and throw people out of their homes in violation of international law, again, because these territories are not Israeli territory, um, that process is also being accelerated. And I think that the really concerning peril that exists right now is that we're in a climate where there is a clear escalation of violence towards Palestinians, which could theoretically trigger a larger scale violence conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. And we have a climate where even under the Obama administration, Israel was unconstrained to a certain degree in the last war on Gaza in 2014 that led to the killing of over 500 Palestinian children. And when you imagine that Israel is less constrained today with the Trump administration in power, that there could be much larger scale violence. This is a fairly dangerous situation that we live in today. But with great peril also comes great opportunity. Because if you look at American domestic discourse on this issue, you can't help but notice that it has shifted very significantly. Opinion polls show that younger people and more diverse constituents are more critical of Israel and are calling for a more balanced US policy approach. Uh, you notice that there is wide recognition that the Netanyahu government is not a contributor to peace. Now, you know, there was always this um, slogan, really, to call it anything, that Israel does not have a peace partner. And now there is finally recognition on some level that actually the Israeli government's policies are part of the problem. That is progress. The idea that an organization like APAC speaks for the American Jewish community, that consensus has also been busted. You have the diversity of the American Jewish community is much more present today with centrist organizations like J Street and more left-leaning organizations like If Not Now and Jewish Voice for Peace. These are emerging, and that emergence has also created more political space for people to be critical of Israeli policy without being falsely accused of anti-Semitism. And then you have a situation where every single Democratic candidate running for president has skipped the APAC conference last year, which is also unprecedented and not something that we had seen before, and we'll wait to see what happens moving forward. And then you have many candidates currently running speaking boldly about in the face of Israeli policy that is talking about potentially annexing the West Bank formally, of course, we already have de facto annexation, but they're talking about making that formal policy. And virtually every candidate who has commented on the issue has said that they will not take any measures off the table as a means of pressuring Israel to reverse such a policy. So there is room in political discourse right now for seeing something different. And then there is the spread of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, BDS, which is a way for people to take matters into their own hands, who were tired of sort of the stalling political process and the lack of action from different governments to actually step in and apply the needed pressure to get things moving, is to try to isolate Israel economically and diplomatically in an effort to get a shift in Israeli policy. And the spread of that movement throughout the United States on college campuses and so on has not gone unnoticed. In fact, it has led to a pretty significant reaction where you have right now laws being pushed in different states, and many of them that have passed, that undermine the right to free speech in the United States on account of shielding Israel from such laws. You have an effort to basically say that Americans, if they boycott Israel, they can be punished by the state by not being awarded government contracts. This is a clear violation of the First Amendment. There have been multiple lawsuits. The ACLU has been suing on behalf of activists who have been affected by this, and there have been, these laws have been struck down in at least three different states so far. But this is an ongoing battle that we're witnessing right now in defense of free speech. And then you have an effort to expand the definition of anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel as part of that definition. And you have similar battles being waged right now where the ACLU, once again, is opposing efforts to expand that definition in a way that clearly hinders free speech. Now, in terms of what can be done practically at this point, there is obviously, I think, for people operating within the United States, defense of the First Amendment on this ground is a clear battle that has to be fought because it really goes beyond the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You don't have to care about Palestinians or their human rights or their land 
to know that something as precious as the First Amendment being undermined is a very serious problem, and I think that that's the kind of issue that all Americans of all walks of life ought to be engaged in. And there is also the issue of trying to hold candidates running for president accountable in terms of their rhetoric on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because for far too long, we've allowed candidates to get away by simply paying lip service to the two-state solution. That's all they talk about, is I support a two-state solution, I'm against, you know, whatever, both, you know, there's this whole false equivalence about responsibility for the conflict, which is fine, everybody can pander, but it should not be enough anymore to talk about a two-state solution, because simply talking about a two-state solution is something we have done for the past 20 years, and it has led to the complete erosion of the two-state solution as we're witnessing today. And so candidates ought to be pressured, and I think that's something for anybody who's engaged in the political process, is to say that candidates have to be pushed on saying that if you still advocate for a two-state solution, if you think that is still possible and that's the vision to pursue, what are you going to do specifically that has not been done before to make it happen? And I think holding candidates' feet to the fire is a critical issue. Now looking at it from the Arab world's perspective, I think there is something also important there to be said, which is that the Arab world put forward the Arab Peace Initiative. And the idea behind that was that the Arab world would fully normalize relations with Israel in exchange for Israel withdrawing from the occupied Palestinian territories and finding a just solution for Palestinian refugees. It's a pretty significant step. I mean, this rhetoric about how Israel is isolated in the Arab world and all that stuff, when you look at this, it, it just does not match with reality. And I think what's important right now is that in the spirit of the boycott movement, what the Arab world should do is the opposite of the Arab Peace Initiative in the sense of, if Israel does X, we're going to fully normalize relations. Now that Israel has made it clear that X is not on the table, there will not be an end to the occupation, there will not be um, any attempt to settle the refugees' right of uh, either return or compensation or any of that, then it simply follows that there should be more diplomatic isolation of Israel in the region until these efforts are met. And even though there is no certainty for the future, these things, if they were to happen, would not necessarily guarantee that we're going to be heading um, towards resolving this conflict, but it certainly puts us in a position where we're better situated and giving it the best chance possible to finally resolve one of the most politically intractable conflicts that we've been dealing with in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another speaker who uh, fortunately showed up uh, at the last minute, uh, Jonathan Katab, um, who I'd like to invite up to talk about whatever he wants. No one has said anything about bringing Hamas and the Palestinian Authority together. Uh, maybe you have ideas about that. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Listening to this conference and particularly this uh, wonderful uh, panel, uh, I'm struck by the contrast between optimism and hope. There's very little cause to be optimistic about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. On the surface, everything looks really despair. We have no power. All the forces seem to be lined up against us. And yet we have hope. Because we know that underneath all the surface, there is a tremendous faith for the Palestinian people, for the Arab people, that justice will ultimately prevail that we can and should find a path towards reconciliation, towards relative, if not absolute, justice, towards true, genuine coexistence based on integrity and equality rather than domination and oppression. And we know deep down that this will happen that those who ignore the Palestinian problem, as in fact most politicians and most pundits and most of the elites and most of the politicians in the area are carrying on as if it doesn't exist, will in fact be suddenly faced by a reality which they can no longer ignore. 
Because ultimately, the Palestinian people, against all odds, with every possible indicator working against them, have in fact persisted, in fact have thrived, in fact has deepened their commitment to live, to exist, not to go away. Now, how can we bring about that change? The only way we can bring about that change is to break some of the supposed conventional wisdom, some of the constraints that have been placed upon us that block the path towards a solution. One of them has already been mentioned. How can you possibly have peace if you ignore Hamas? And now I'm no apologist for Hamas. I'm a Christian and I'm a secularist. But Hamas represents something within the Palestinian community that needs to be brought into the process. You cannot deal with Gaza without dealing with Hamas, and you cannot deal with Palestine without dealing in, in Gaza. You cannot simply close your eyes and pretend that two million people living under total siege with four hours of electricity a day, 95% undrinkable water, nobody can go in and out, close to 50% unemployment rate, you cannot continue to exist like that. You must deal with that reality, and to deal with that reality, you must deal with Hamas. The second thing is we have to deal with genuine democratization in Palestine and in the rest of the Arab world. The people no longer can live the way their parents lived. People were excited about the Arab Spring, and after a while, they thought that it went away. It did not go away. It is still there. We see it today in Sudan, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Tunisia, and you will see it throughout the Arab world. It has not disappeared. The aspiration of people to be free, to be treated with human dignity, to participate in their government and not to be simply ruled by local elites of any kind is a reality. The idea of equality, how can Israel possibly imagine that apartheid and discrimination as a system of law is going to persist in the 21st century? It cannot do that. How it will end, we still don't know, but we know for a fact, just like apartheid fell, and the wall in Berlin fell, and the whole communist Soviet machinery was destroyed, just like the Shah fell, Hosni Mubarak fell, other people fell, this also cannot persist in the face of reality. How do we bring that reality to happen? And how can we do that? Hopefully nonviolently, hopefully peacefully, hopefully through recognition of people's equality and people's lives. The system that Israel has created in the occupied territories, in Gaza, and in Israel itself, based on a religious and ethnic rule by one group over another, simply cannot be maintained in the 21st century. So the reality is we have hope. We may not be optimistic in the short term. And those who only look at the surface of things will say, this will never happen. Palestinians don't have power. Arabs generally don't have power. Muslims generally throughout the world are perhaps living in one of the weakest periods throughout their long history. But that cannot stay forever. People will, in fact, rise up. People will, in fact, achieve 
dignity and freedom and democracy. And we have to be part of that process. And we have to keep that faith and that hope alive. And we have to be on the right side of history. We cannot be fooled forever into thinking that the current status quo will prevail because it won't. In the end, justice and freedom will prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much from your mouth to God's ears. Uh, as uh, we all know, problems like this are never really solved, but you can trade up for better problems. So that's what we're going to try to do. Um, would somebody like to comment on uh, the effect that uh, Trump's move to um, leave the region um, recently uh, has had on the government of Israel? Would anyone have an opinion on that? <laughs> this means you, maybe. You can turn on your own microphone, of course. You can ask certain questions at a time. And that yeah, you OK. So I think leaving the region is probably a misnomer in terms of the Trump administration's policies. It is abdicating responsibility in very narrow sense in certain ways. You know, there are a lot of people who mistake Trump's move, for example, in northern Syria as an act, you know, the way the rhetoric that Trump himself used on Twitter is this is about ending endless wars and about the US not policing the Middle East. Those are nice, lofty words, but when you look at actual policy, it does not look that way at all. As I've mentioned in the list that I was going through, there was a significant increase in American participation in Israel's war against the Palestinians. Uh, that's not just a matter of American withdrawal. Um, there was a significant increase in um, loosening the rules of engagement on U.S. strikes throughout the region in Iraq, in Syria, um, in other countries in the region as well, where there is now much more significant civilian casualties as a result of American strikes than we've had before this administration came into power. So there is really an expansion of, Amer of America's role in the region in certain senses and then a retraction in some others. So certainly the way that the United States withdrew from particular roles, in this case sort of the US allowing Turkey a further reach when it comes to the Kurdish issue, you can say that this is an abdication of American responsibility and it harms American interest in, very specific, in a very specific sense. But as far as Israel is concerned, I don't imagine that Israel is particularly worried because in general, when you look at broad administration policy when it comes to Israel, the policy has been handed over to people like David Friedman and Jared Kushner, people who are pretty close to Israeli elites and who are effectively of one mind with the Netanyahu government when it comes about positioning Israel in a privileged position in the region. So, Thank you. There are some questions here about um, how to uh, rebuild Gaza, how to um, improve the water situation in Gaza and so forth. Is there anything you would like to say, Yusuf, about uh, specific problems in Gaza and uh, how we can help? Uh, well, although I live here, my entire family is in Gaza Strip and I hear uh, the stories every day. Uh, the water contamination has been, quite frankly, an issue even before Hamas took over. Uh, because many of the Israeli excuses of why we have to impose a blockade is because there is a terrorist organization operating in, within the Strip. But even I remember the issues with water and climate change in Gaza. Uh, I remember seeing them uh, even when I myself lived in Gaza. Another thing is the ability of, of to get in and out of Gaza. I've been here since 2006. I came here when I was 17 years old. Today I'm 30 years old. I haven't made it back to Gaza once. And even as a US citizen, I am denied that opportunity because the Israelis say, you're a Palestinian. Unless you give up your Palestinian ID, uh, we will not treat you as a US citizen. Many issues that the uh, UNRWA uh, and the other ideas that have been t talked about here, uh, things that don't even have to do anything with politics. Many uh, students in Gaza are denied full rights to Harvard, Oxford, schools in Australia, even schools in the Arab world, uh, but simply denied the opportunities because they couldn't make it out of Gaza in time to attend that 
conference uh, or that university. So many of these efforts, so that's why in my talk I said we have to approach it on an individual uh, level, case by case uh, uh, basis, because many of those kids, when they make it out, they're able to provide for their families and they're able to provide for their cause wherever they end up being. So how can we help? I know in DC it's usually uh, very easy to say, well, it's complicated, the Israelis are not gonna accept security needs, security needs, security needs. But there are no security risks for Palestinians to make it out to uh, improve and uh, seek education, uh, especially in the US and the UK and throughout Europe. And other issues, climate change, Israel will sooner or later have to deal with the water contamination in the sea because we share the same sea. So sooner or later, that's the issue that is now today known as to be a Gazan issue, a Palestinian issue, will in fact be an Israeli issue uh, in, in no time. And more of that. Do you mind if I squeeze something just small? Yes. Um, I just think that it's important to note that a lot of people think of the Gaza siege as a security policy on the part of Israel. I don't. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think that's an important point to sort of correct for because there has been a while when Israel would not allow potato chips or Coke cans, soda pops, or cookies to enter the Gaza Strip um, early on in the siege. So this was explicitly a policy that was aimed at squeezing people economically in order to make them more politically pliant. And the policy continues to some extent is that there's an aspect of it if you want to say that certain things cannot go into the Gaza Strip without Israel checking them first or one thing. That is one set of arguments, but there's no security reason why Gaza can't sell its vegetation around the world, why there can't be exports that could help people economically without presenting any kind of security issue at all. So I just think that it's critical for people to understand that the Gaza siege is not about security. It is primarily about squeezing people economically in order to produce a specific political outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here about why. We had oh, one more. Sorry, time. go ahead, please. Can I just yeah. add on, on the Gaza? I, uh, the questioner asked about rebuilding, and that isn't really the question. I mean, it's mostly been rebuilt from the 2014 war, but it's it's this. It, we throw around the phrase "the largest open air prison," but it really is a it's a prison. And this issue of not being able to move freely is really what's most devastating. And when you're when you're in Gaza, and I encourage people to go, and it's it's hard, but it's not as hard as people think. People think you can't go at all. If you're interested. You know, we can help people get in if there's some connection to our work and we, we help people get in. But uh, important to see it because people are going on with their lives and there's economic activity going on. I often say that Gaza is on the brink of catastrophe, but it's on the brink of success. And on the water and electricity issues, still a huge problem. People are without electricity. Most of the water is contaminated. But it wouldn't take a whole lot. And it's really about political will and lifting of some barriers. And, and international donors have built large... Uh, um, uh, water plants and uh, 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 wastewater reuse. Uh, we're working in this area. There's a lot that can be. There's a lot that can be done. Um, but this issue of not being able to move and not having information go back and forth is a huge hindrance. Thank you. <clears throat> um, what about the refugees? There are a couple of questions here about um, Palestinian refugees. Whether they can be. Uh, what will happen to them, whether they can be uh, resorbed or whatever into um, their uh, homeland, if there's a, only a one-state solution. Can you uh, speak to that issue, Elizabeth? Sure. I mean, I, I think the biggest challenge we have right now is there's no political process, right? So no one's talking about what long-term solution there can be for Palestinians writ large, let alone refugees. And the, prob the bigger problem is that everyone is trying to put the cart before the horse, meaning that there have been widespread uh, um, attempts, including by the White House and others, to say, UNRWA should dissolve, UNRWA should go away, and then, you know, at some point, a solution that we've been thinking about and writing about for a long time will be made clear. <laughs> That's extremely dangerous. That's extremely dangerous to tear down that development infrastructure before there is a political process. And so, again, what everyone needs to remember is that UNRWA is simply there working on human development and humanitarian response. And actually, we're doing quite an extraordinary job under very volatile and difficult and hyper-politicized uh, environments. What is required is a political solution. That is it. And it can, to, to answer the question very simply, it can look a lot of different kinds of ways. But people need to come together and have a conversation. And that's simply not happening. Mm -hmm. there, a question just came up uh, regarding the news that um, Benny Gantz will be uh, attempting to form a government. Is this uh, good news to anyone? Is this any better than um, Netanyahu's attempting to uh, form a government? 
Well, to me as a Palestinian, any day without Bibi is a good day. Uh, so I'm just going to choose to be optimistic. Hopefully the fact that the Arab parties have made their voice uh, heard this time around will make an impact within the Israeli elections for the betterment of everyone involved. I might break with that a little bit. Please. In the sense that certainly there are he's, you know, m extremely minor improvements, but I don't think that these improvements are significant enough to actually impact policy towards the Palestinians writ large. We have when Netanyahu was talking about annexing the West Bank, Benny Gantz's party said that that was actually their idea. So the general consensus, and you know, Gantz was also calling for a tougher response from Netanyahu against Gaza when there was the issue with, with rockets being fired and so on. There is every reason to believe that there is going to be a continuation of current Israeli policy towards the Palestinians. But then you've taken away something, which is that there is such wide American consensus right now that Netanyahu is a bad actor. And by replacing him with somebody else, we may have set ourselves back to a previous era in the so-called peace process, where now people are hopeful and talking about how the problem if only Palestinians were to step forward and participate in a process that we all know is a sham, that there would be a misallocation of the blame once again on the Palestinians because you removed an actor that everybody recognizes to be the problem, and you've placed somebody else in there who is equally a problem, but who is less recognized as much as mm -hmm. that. So there is an upside and a downside to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're at the end of our time. There's a, a moment for um, panelists to um, make a final remark if you would like to. Everybody has said everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to again make the point that uh, peace between Israel, between Israelis and Palestinians is possible. In, in some ways, it is both practically very difficult, practically impossible, but historically inevitable. Arabs and Jews are going to be living together in that same land. There's just no way other way. The only question is, are they going to live there as equals, with dignity, or are they going to live there as master and slave. And, and history has told us it's not going to happen. Master and slave, slavery has been removed. I mean, people don't remember that 100 years ago, women didn't even have the vote in America. 150 years ago, African Americans were chattel. They were bought and sold. So the, the move towards equality, the move towards human dignity, the move towards a, a, a respect for individuals, for human rights, is a historic move that cannot be denied for a long time. It can be pushed back, it can be suppressed, but eventually it will break out. And this is what I am trying to convey to everybody here. Don't be surprised because there will be major changes throughout the Arab world and the Muslim world. And certainly, Palestine is going to be at the heart of those changes. Thank you I, for saying that. I would say, can I just? Oh, yeah, please. I, I, I would say um, I, I agree with that. But in the absence of any movement towards it, let's not give up on human development and engagement with the Palestinians and not hold it hostage to movement on the peace process or to making programs about Israeli-Palestinian peace. The population is tired, they feel burned, they feel like that didn't get them anywhere, and so they want to work on schools and health clinics and uh, getting jobs in the tech industry, and uh, we've got to keep focusing on that and not say, well, we're, we can't do any of that unless and until there's peace, because mm -hmm. that's, that's criminally ne negligent uh, on a human development level. That's right, all human life is local. Back to you, John yeah. DeCaffrey. Thank you. Well, one sees the passion and the compassion and the morality and the ethics uh, laced and interlocked with this uh, particular issue. And the uh, paradox here is that uh, all of us who are parents and those who are still striving for early adulthood have heard teacher after teacher, preacher after preacher, parent after parent say, you know, America's a great place, but let us not uh, be naive and cover over the fact 
that we hear two great stains on it. Starting in 1619, master and slave relationship began here in an institutionalized way. And it remained until the proclamation of emancipation in 1863. And then you had the Jim Crow discrimination laws that existed long after that. I'm from the South. And I remember the civil rights laws of 1963, 64, 65. They were so controversial, they had to be broke, broken up into three years. 13 states in the South, not one Southern senator out of the 26 Southern senators voted for a single one of those civil rights laws, okay? In the House of Representatives, I don't know what the exact number was, 130, 148, only one Southerner dared to vote for these civil rights laws. And as a result, he was resoundingly defeated in the next election. Uh, this has happened in the lifetime of half of those sitting here. So this uh, was a stain, remains a stain. Uh, and then, in terms of concentration camps, uh, beautified with a euphemism called reservations, there of the people who owned the land here, who were the indigenous inhabitants. And three of our panel members are indigenous inhabitants of Palestine. Uh, they had that dignity equal dignity or equal indignity uh, prior to 1947-48. A different way of looking at equality. But they certainly have not had that equality since then. And the reason is the United States backing of what has happened to the Palestinian people. I say this as a former soldier as a consultant to the United States government for 45 years, as a member of the Sanctions Committee in the U.S. Department of State, and an advisor to defense, and in the past, the Intelligence College there. These are truths. Like Jonathan Kotab said, you cannot deny these things, nor the implications of them. Acts and facts have consequences and implications for everything that people stand for in their family, in their schools, in their churches, mosques, and synagogues, and with their coaches and their teachers. They're these six individuals personify the pain of the stain and the blight, and it will remain unless we have leaders of conviction and commitment and courage, not just physical and political courage, but the moral courage. We can do it. We can do it. I know we can do it. We have to do it. Thank you.